Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 15, One Up Wrap Up. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. We want to hear from you. Each week, we hope to highlight some of your feedback, whether it's positive or negative. Lots of feedback from our Halloween episode this week. Yes. Yes, I kind of expected this. Uh, as I said in the episode, my tastes don't really mirror the general public's when it comes to horror games. And that was very obvious on the large amount of feedback I got basically telling me I was wrong or forgot certain games. So, for all of you, here are the suggestions from our fans. So, Phil Hatfield writes, Two picks of mine not mentioned by you are Ghosts Love Candy, a neat little game with ghosts trying to inhabit uh, trick-or-treating kids to try to get them to eat candy, giving the ghosts points without making the kids sick. And my favorite, A Touch of Evil, fantastic gothic horror game with a wonderful B-movie type feel. Multiple villains that are all quite different in how they play out, and multiple heroes to play, along with a variety of encounter cards, make this game immensely replayable. Right. Add in that, can be, that it can be played competitively, cooperatively, or in teams, and it means it can work for any type of gamer, and it can play solo all the way up to eight players in just the base game. Add in the expansions, and you have up to 24 different heroes and 14 different villains with replay galore. Uh, you know, that makes it sound so good, but the artwork, like, have you seen this game? I couldn't get past the cover on A Touch of Evil. Like, I, I have you seen it? It's, it's frightening. Like, Phil's not the only one to mention this game, and I probably shouldn't judge a game by its cover and give it a shot. But, man, I cannot stand the cosplay-esque photoshopped Friends of the Designer art style in that game at all. I, I guess I should give it a chance. Everyone's telling me it's good. I'm going to have to like close my eyes while I play it. Uh, Chris Groff, Groff. Sorry, Chris. I've met Chris. I should at least pronounce his name right. Uh, he writes, King of Tokyo with the Halloween expansion feels appropriate. And while I wouldn't recommend them, there are some appropriately themed versions of Flux and Munchkin for those that do. I'm assuming he means do enjoy them. Uh, another obvious choice is Touch of Evil. There it is again. Uh, there are, of course, many zombie-themed games from the perennial Zombies to Zombicide and the recently released Tiny Epic Zombies. My current personal choice, though, would be the Bloodborne card game. This is a group of hunters fighting horrible monsters as well as working with and against each other to emerge the victor from the dungeon. Definitely no shortage of games for Halloween. That's our second re uh, recommendation for Touch of Evil. Now, say yeah. what you will, but after I looked at the artwork for that game, I have to side with the bellhop here. I, I admit to being it's... an art snob at times, uh, and I do my own graphical work, but that was a, a good idea for imagery that went somewhere along the, <laughs> the process very badly. Uh, now, you'll get to hear the bellhop's thoughts on Tiny Epic Zombies a little later in the show. Now... Peter Kissner writes, thanks, Peter. Uh, <laughs> not sure what happened there. I'm not sure. Thanks. That ghost fighting treasure hunters game might just be, uh, be just the thing. Even at eight and 10 years, my kids don't seem to have the patience to sit through the rules for high complexity games, but they do like minis. The following day, Peter wrote back again, ghost fighting treasure hunters arrived today. We literally tore it out of the package and started playing oh, within so 10 minutes of arrival the kids ha only had time to play one game and lost, barely, but had a real blast anyway. Everyone is eager to play again. Thanks for the recommendation. That is fantastic news, Peter. Uh, it always makes me feel good when I recommend a game and it goes over well, especially when it's a kid's game. Um, I, know, I realize whenever I put a game recommendation out there, I'm taking a risk that people may not enjoy it as much as I am, which is why I try to point out why I like a game, not just, hey, it's great, go buy it. Uh, it's great to hear 
that Peter was able to pick up ghost fighting treasure hunters and even better that his kids went for it and loved it. I hope he's tried again and I hope they've won since then. Joe Swick writes, for those with kids, this is fun. Vampire Hunter. Now, I remember seeing this one in stores. It has a tower in the middle and a round board. And there's a light in the tower. And you turn it. And in daytime, it's red light. And at nighttime, it's a blue light. And then the map has the the whole, you know, the old Transformers thing. I don't know what you call that. But, like, when the red light's showing, you can see certain things. And when the blue light's showing, you can see other things. It's like when you'd read the stats on the back of Bumblebee. You had to hold that, that red piece of uh, whatever, cheap piece of plastic over top. It looked kind of neat. It looked kind of gimmicky, but it looked kind of cool. I don't actually know the game at all. Yeah, so that game does actually require a playing in a dark room uh, because they not only the board game, but the tiles and the dice both oh, wow. hide and reveal things uh, depending on the wavelength of light, which is why they've got the red and the blue, so they can uh, separate the wavelengths as much as possible and not have overlap. Very uh, neat. Uh, now, we get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Also, feel free to reach out on social media. Just look for Tabletop Bellhop, one word on pretty much every network out there. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? Now, every week, I like to look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com. So the big thing that happened this past weekend was Extra Life. That's, But that's our main topic. So I'm not going to talk about all the games we played for Extra Life as the Week in Review. So what I do want to talk about is the one game I did get to play this week that wasn't at Extra Life. And that's my shiny new Kickstarter copy of Brass, specifically Brass Lancashire. Now, Brass is a game by Martin Wallace, uh, well-known for writing um, heavier economic Euro games. Uh, it was originally released in 2007. I personally didn't touch Brass, the original, until 2015. Now, when I got the original, I had trepidations for the same reason I didn't buy Touch of Evil, though a different reason. I guess Brass didn't, if it had had real people wearing a top hat on it, maybe I would have completely avoided it. But man, the game's ugly. Like, this isn't, the cover's fine. It's, you know, the typical dude staring off into the distance that's on, like, every Euro game ever. And there's a train in the background because it's about the Industrial Revolution. Sure. Uh, but the board and the chits and the colors they chose from the players, like, it is a nasty-looking game. But not anymore. For a visual yeah. look at the game's unboxing in the new version, you can check our Twitch highlights, or you can go over to our YouTube channel and catch the video there. Yes, when I got this one, it took a couple weeks to get to it, but I did do a full unboxing where I show off this shiny new version. Uh, this one was put out by Roxley Games. It just came out on Kickstarter in 2018. Um, they put out the original Brass, which is Brass Lancashire, and they actually put out a second game. The second one is based on the original game, but was reworked by some modern designers. That is Brass Birmingham. I haven't, I've opened my copy of Brass Birmingham, but I haven't tried it yet. When I did the Kickstarter, I Kickstarted both. Um, so, so far I played Lancashire and I played that last Monday. Now, the first thing, I, go watch the video, you should see this. It, this thing's beautiful, especially when you compare it to the old one. I backed at the top level. So in addition to the games, I got these amazing gamer poker chips that they call iron clays. Like these things are really nice high end poker chips that get rid of all the usual gambling paraphernalia that's on a poker chip, right? Like you don't have all the hearts and spades and 2D6 in the middle or any of that. These just say like $1, $5, $10, and I think there's a $20. There's a really nice pattern on them, and they could be used in any game in your collection. And even better, when I backed the Kickstarter, I thought I was getting one set of these to play with both games. No, I got a set in each box. So big bonus there from Roxley. Probably if I, it's probably my own reading comprehension. If I'd read it, I probably would have known I was getting two. But I was happy to get two because I thought I was only getting one. And you can get a great look at them on the video. We got them, they got right up close to the camera. And you can yeah. see that they are just far from a cheap counter. Uh, it's, you know, quality product. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Really nice, uh, nice weight to them. They're the, 
Bakelite with a, there's actually metal weight in them. Like they're real poker chips. They're real nice chips. So what's Brass? Brass is an economic strategy game that takes part during the Industrial Revolution, specifically in the area of Lancashire, which is an area of uh, Britain that has is known for all their channels and is known as the heart of the Industrial Revolution. In the game, players own companies and you are developing, building, and establishing a network of industries and ports across Lancashire. Uh, you're trying to capitalize on the growing iron and coal industry while attempting to ship cotton to various ports, both overseas and to Europe. You play through two phases. So the first phase, and this is a historically accurate thing, is when the coal industry blew up, everything was transported by canals as that was the quickest way to move mass quantities of heavy material. So the first phase of the game is the canal phase where you're building these networks and you're building a canal network. Then you jump to the rail phase and this was when the huge change of the steam engine came in and that was brought to the area. Now, the actual mechanics are a mix of card playing, economics, and rope building. So this is on the heavier side of games. Uh, it's, uh, it ranks around a four out of five uh, on the heavy scale. So you know, be wary. Be wary. If if you're interested, be be aware that it's going to be uh, quite a slog for some people if you're not uh, into those bigger, heavier games. Yeah, I will admit the actual actions in this game are not complicated, but it's all about how your maneuvers are going to interact with the opponents and understanding the economics of the game. Uh, timing and when to take loans when not to like this is all mark wallace these are the kind of games he designs are these heavier economic stock based games so if you're into that kind of thing like if you like acquire this would be a nice step up it is it is um not easy to teach, but once you play through, especially your first canal phase, you'll get it. But then you'll have played so badly in that first canal phase, you'll want to play a second time. Or you'll have decided, wow, this is not a game for me. So as far as the world's concerned, Brass is up there. Like, it's been in the top 25 as long as I've been on Board Game Geek. It, it's, as far as I know, it's never dropped. It's considered by many to be Martin Wallace's best game. It is currently ranked 24 overall and number 18 in all strategy games. Now, no, all strategy games covers pretty much every Euro. Catan is listed as a strategy game. It's a very broad category, and it's number 18. That's huge. Now, this game would actually probably be ranked even a little higher. Um, but when you look at the actual uh, low-end rankings that are bringing it down, uh, some of them either don't take, take into account the new game. There's a lot of discussion about how ugly this game how is. How ugly. And that has, yeah. brought down, that has brought down the rankings, um, where, whereas the new version uh, couldn't pick that up. The other problem is there seems to be some nonsensical non-understanding of the game by a lot of people who mm. have ranked it down. The people who did a lot of these people who did comment on the lower on the lower uh, rankings, it just didn't make sense what they were saying. Uh, so okay. I, you know, again, I think I think this could probably uh, you know slide up another couple of you know point one or point two without much mm. difficulty if the uh, if the rankings uh, made a little more sense. Yeah, I was surprised that Board Game Geek didn't put this in as a separate entry. Like when, uh, there's a lot of games, I'm drawing a blank. Like Mansions of Madness, first edition, second edition are two different entries. Yeah. Um, oh, what is that? Jeff Engelstein's favorite game. Merchant of Venus. Merchant of Venus reminds me more of this because Merchant of Venus was an old Avalon Hill game. They republished it, Fancy Flight republished it, and it has all the original rules. And then it has a bunch of other optional rules that make it a little better. And that's two separate entries, whereas Brass, for some reason, there's still just the one entry and they updated all the graphics and the pictures are, all, excuse me, are the new Kickstarter version. Yeah. I'm a little surprised by that. And it's interesting but, because you can, you can actually, I was able to compare both versions because all the images in it are from both versions of the game. Mm -hmm. So you can actually yes. look and, and compare the two boards under that one, which, is, which was nice for me to be able to compare. Yeah. But again, with the, with the blend of uh, of ranking and scoring, it, it made for an odd. Uh, it makes for an odd uh, ranking overall. Yeah, it's kind of strange. But anyway, that's a board board game geek idiosyncrasy. At some point, you'll get to hear a bonus episode of our podcast where we'll talk about board game geek. Uh, Back to Brass and how, how is it? It's still as good as it was when I first played it in 2015. Uh, we played three-player. We had a fantastic time. Uh, it did take us a bit to grok it because it's not, it's, it's 
not a transparent game. It's a bit opaque. It takes a bit. This is probably where the weird comments come in. Is when you first start off, it's kind of like, I don't know what to do with this. I have all these industries I can build, or I can build canals, or I can try to ship stuff, or I can try to level. I'm going to use RPG terms. I can level up my equipment. It's called develop. You can. You have to put your chips chits out in order, and they start terrible and get better. So the more industries you build, the better they get. Well, one of the actions you can take is just throw two chits out of the game. So you don't get to put anything out that turn, but it jumps you ahead on the tech track, if we'll put it that way. Um, so it, it took a bit for us to get going and, and remember how to play. But then again, by halfway through the first canal phase, definitely by the time, because at the end of the canal phase you score, definitely by that point we knew exactly what we were doing. We did play the extreme version really close. We realized we did something wrong. And to be honest, I can't remember what it was. I do remember we caught it early enough that we were able to back up. Like, we didn't even have to restart. We were just like, oh, wait, that's what that means. Let's back this up. Um, there were some mistakes made. Like, people didn't realize their ports didn't have to connect to their own canal network, etc. I'm not going to get into the minutia. Uh, but immediately when we finished, we were like, okay, now everyone gets it. And, man, that, that was good but not great but it could be great because we just if we'd known better we would have played better and it, but it took us about two hours and we didn't really have the time and now i would say it's not a two-hour game normally but for us trying to remember how to play it took us a long time well you know board game uh, geek has it as a 60 to 120 uh minutes so you were yeah. you were on the upper end of the uh the the scale but within within a normal time so now that you're now that you've gotten back into it you can probably pick that up and get down closer to the one hour time yeah uh, with i would think play. so i would guess so i said this is my first time playing it since 2015 so three years had gone by since i'd even read the rules for brass which is kind of a bad sign when i'm like i love the game but i haven't played it in three years but it's as you mentioned it's it's not for everyone right you need the right group this isn't a show it up at the local game store and when people walk in the door and they're like hey i play Catan," you're like sit down play brass you'll love it no no it's not that kind of game you need the right group so anyway um after the fact we played i did some research to find out what was different so they did change a few things so there were some minor rules there there was something called a virtual connection between two of the ports and they made that a com they removed it like it just doesn't exist and it had to do with in one of the phases you could connect two cities and the other phase you couldn't they just ditched that um they did streamline the amount of cards what they really improved was that um Supposedly three player is significantly better because you remove some cards when playing. So it makes the, the route building a little more condensed and a little more competitive. Uh, the original game did not include two player rules, but there was a variant out on the net that was fantastic. And I actually, and she games and I played using those rules and they were great. Well, now that's integrated. It's, it's right in the rules. You flip the board over and it's got a two player side that uses that. Um, from what I read, there are a couple other minor tweaks, like num industry numbers. Like I guess the level one cotton mill was really bad before and it's still bad, but not as bad. But like, you know what? It's, it's been three years since I played. I didn't notice there were any changes and I just have to assume based on feedback that they're good changes and they're positive changes. Like I didn't, I wasn't like, wow, it was better than when I played it three years ago. I'm like, I don't remember. It was still good. Yeah. There were, there were a number of uh, restructured rules that went around uh, back in the day. And I think those have just been uh, encompassed into the new game. They, you know, they, they took the, uh, they took the player's advice and uh, made, made a few tweaks along the way. Which is what I want to see in a deluxe game, right? Like, that's that's what I want to see in a, a, a uh, reprint like this. So it's not all shiny and perfect. I do have a complaint. Uh, the new artwork on the board is nice and evocative, and it's as dark, and it looks like you're spreading coal everywhere and doing horrible things to the environment because of the Industrial Revolution, and it's kind of beautiful, and it looks really nice, but it's actually way less functional than the original. The biggest problem was the route building. So what they did is they put the canals and the rails right next to each other. So you either have a black line or you have a black line with a blue line next to it. And they're really thin. Now on the old board, from across the table, I could easily see every route on the board. And I could easily see which industries I want to build. This one, we were leaning in. Like, we're like, wait, is, that a, is there a route there? And multiple times we were playing, players went to make a move, only to realize they couldn't do it. So it's like, oh, I'm going to build a canal between... Uh, sorry, I don't remember any of the cities on the board. <laughs> I'm going to build a canal between these two. Oh, wait. Oh, that's a railroad. I can't do that. That happened a little more often than I would have liked. Now, 
the thing is, you're going to figure it out eventually, right? So if you play more often, you're probably going to remember. But overall, I kind of prefer the old map for actual gameplay. Like, yeah, it didn't look as good on the table, but the fact that I could see across the board was nice. Yeah, looking at the game, they not only not only are, are the uh, um, are the colors more contrasty on the old board, but they actually yes. separated the canals and railroads, mm-hmm. so there was a very obvious, uh, you know difference and you you know you could you were you weren't looking for, in one line to see if there were two things that there or not you were looking in two different places and that, that definitely right. made it. it was hideous but <laughs> the playability was definitely there um uh, and i but i i think um again judging looking by the pictures uh, it looks like the actual lighting in the room might actually make a difference because i noticed some of the huh? darker pictures the the canal ways actually pop a little more so okay. you might you, it might be something where you can play with your lighting depending I know I, in your in your in your game room at least you know you're stuck if you're at the FLGS but uh, down in the game mm-hmm. room you might be able to make the uh, canals pop a little more compared to the trains. Yeah, it's definitely I can definitely try that. Like it's, I've mentioned before on the show, I do have the lighting I can adjust. But like overall, like yeah, I'm, I'm a little bummed by that, but it's still a minor complaint. Like after one play. I, again, I don't remember City X and Y, what they're called, but I'm never going to forget that X and Y don't have a canal route yet because it came up in the game. Um, and there were some route markers that are really tiny little hexagons with a little like line with two dots on it. Those took a bit to find the first time. But again, it got pretty simple because it was like every city has one and some have two and you get to know which ones have two. So, But overall, I got to say the good outweighs the bad. Things like the player boards, the improved chits, uh, the iron clays, if nothing else, the the player counters, the distant marker tiles, the way the um, scoring track is set up is all so much better that I can overlook the fact that I may have to stare at the map a little closer when I'm playing instead of being able to sit back going, yeah, yeah, I can easily see that. Yeah. Now, I will note that Birmingham, the other version of the game, looks significantly brighter. Just when I did the unboxing, like the one side of the board is almost white and the other side looks like it's nighttime with a bunch of like lanterns lit all over it. So maybe that'll be better. I don't know. I haven't played yet. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 930 Eastern on Twitch and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Uh, tonight we've been chatting and uh, having a lot of talk. Uh, Jeff, I guess, used the seventh C poker chips that he got uh, at uh, at Extra Life, even though they, even though they're branded, they're a nice poker chip, but they're branded as seventh okay. C. But he's been pulling those out and used them at Extra Life for uh, some of the uh, the cheat jar uh, IOUs. <laughs> nice. Uh, and also we had uh, Fury of Dracula mentioned as one of the Halloween games. Okay. Um, that is a classic. That that was originally put out by Games Workshop back in the day. I own the original printing of that. And now I think it's on the fifth edition is coming out either this year or next year. Hugely popular game. I played it a couple times. And again, I don't know. I wasn't a fan. It was it was not for me. Um, and she games note letter for Whitechapel. That's another one that's actually very similar. They're both um, one versus many games where one player is hiding and the other players are trying to find you. So really, they're gamers' versions of Scotland Yard. They're, they're improvements on Scotland Yard. In one, whether well, it's from Whitechapel, one person's Jack the Ripper. And in Fury of Dracula, one person's Dracula. The one thing that's different in Fury of Dracula, and I've heard this is actually a complaint on the game, is that once you find Dracula, you have to beat him up. Being a Games Workshop game, I think that fits. But they're saying that that's a lot of people don't like the ending of Fury of Dracula because it often ends like, yeah, I caught him, and then he beats you up and you lose the game. Uh, I, the version I played, I think, was the third edition. Like, I own the first edition and never played it. Sorry, it happens now and then. Uh, I stole the minis out of it, and then the next time I went to play, I couldn't find the minis, so I just never played it. Um, I think I played, I think it was the third edition, and it was just fiddly. Like, there were these cards you had to put where you were a Dracula to prove where you went. And if I remember correctly, someone screwed up, which is the problem with all of these games, where if the person hiding doesn't record where they moved properly, the game's broken. So same reason I didn't like Madness of Madness first edition. If you set it up wrong as the keeper, it can break the game. Uh, just, so I tend to stay away from them. I think the closest I had for one of those style of games, I think was called Nuns on the Run, because it was like a super light version. I had some fun with that. All right. 
So yeah, Jeff's biggest game was Letters from Whitechapel for Halloween. Letters from Whitechapel I've never played, so I don't I just know it kind of falls in between the whole Scotland Yard, Fury of Dracula for, for level. Um, what's the other hidden movement one that everyone was playing for a while there? Sci-fi, Spectre Ops, which I guess wouldn't be a Halloween-themed game, but it uses those mechanics. I do see Blood Boiler has been in the chat and um, agrees with our comments on Brass that it looks amazing, the production overall is fantastic, but those canals next to the railroads. Like, I don't get it. The old board had them split up, like, I don't know. It's the one thing I, I wish they'd done just slightly different. All right. You can find us all across the web now. We grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform and help us spread our gaming advice to the world. <laughs> Yes, uh, we say it every episode. It's still true. Apple reviews help people find us. So sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the weeks previous. Uh, one went out today. It was a little light because I was a little busy, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But uh, it was a little lighter than usual, but we'll let you know what we posted. So if there's any new blog posts, any new podcast episodes, any bonus episodes we're going to be doing, any reviews, anything else we create, you will get a link to it in your email, letting you know what's up here at the Bellhop. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe on the sidebar. So our next giveaway is coming up. Now that Extra Life is done, I can start working on it. I plan to announce it with an unboxing video. I'm quivering with excitement about this one. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Real, real <laughs> subtle. And someone in the chat room already knows, so... Yeah, someone must read the newsletter. Apparently. We may give away information in that that we don't post anywhere else. Yeah, everyone else will just have to wait or sign up. So every week, as part of Throwback Thursday, I'm going to resurrect an old piece of gaming content, something I wrote years ago on some other platform. I'll be republishing the original article, then adding my thoughts about the topic now. Has my opinion changed? Uh, this week, we're recharging Power Grid, the Friedman Freeze Classic. Now, we spoke about this in episode 10 because it was on our top 20 list. Yes, it was. Uh, Power Grid came out in 2004, and it was hot. Like, it was the big game of the day back then. When I was getting into modern hobby board games, everyone was talking about Power Grid. It was in the top five on Board Game Geek. It might have been number one. I don't remember. That was a long time ago. Like, it was the scythe, the root of its time. Which says a lot about the games people were playing back then. When a spreadsheet topped the list. <laughs> well, spreadsheet the game. <laughs> totally don't agree with that. Uh, I personally didn't actually get to try Power Grid until 2006. And right after I played it, I felt the need to go home and go on the Windsor Gaming Resource Forum, which was an old free pro boards forum that I set up when I had just got out of university. And this was like the, the home for the local gaming community. And I had to post this. Oh, my God, I finally got to play Power Grid. I had to get that out there. You know, and, and how times change to think way back in the day, we used to go to a site and get XP for interacting with people while we talked about games and wait a second. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> Full circle. So the most interesting thing I found uh, rereading my original review was that I was blown away by some of the mechanics. Like the thing that really blew my mind, this game had an auction and other stuff. It wasn't just the auction. Like the auction wasn't the point of the game. It wasn't just modern art or raw. Like you the auction was just a small part and there was more. I thought that was hilarious rereading that, especially now, because if you've heard our mechanics episode and I've mentioned it a few times, the whole power grid auction mechanic is iconic. Like people say, oh yeah, we use the power grid auction mechanic. Like it's just something that people have been stealing since power grid came out because it has the best auction mechanic in the industry. And I wasn't blown away by the auction mechanic. It was the fact that there was an auction mechanic and other stuff. I thought that was funny. So just like the last re-review where I talked about He-Man, Master of the Universe, don't go buy it. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Head over to the blog, read it yourself. I mainly am here to just let you know that it's there, and I will give you a bit of an update. 
Now head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. And depending on when you're listening to this, it should be near the top of the list. Yeah, it should. So what I am going to talk about here is, it's obvious, Sean mentioned it, it was in my top 20 games. I still love Power Grid. Uh, Back in episode 10, I talked about it. Power Grid was there. 2006 may have been my first game, but it was nowhere near my last. For many years, if anyone said, what's your favorite game, I was immediately Power Grid. It wasn't until I discovered Wallenstein that it finally dropped from my number one spot and was replaced. It's still up there. It's it's in the top five, top ten. I don't remember exactly out of the 20. I think it made it in the top ten. But as I noted then, it's that list isn't really in order. I still dig Power Grid. I thought it was very neat the first time I played it, and I've enjoyed it since. I don't think I've ever had a bad game of Power Grid. And I've been involved in a game where someone flipped the table because of Power Grid. Now, people split into two camps on this one very strongly uh while its rankings are very high because it is a powerful game and it is an iconic game with an iconic uh, mechanic uh math and non-math uh, there are people who you know basically table flip or or one rate this game specifically because of the calculations and the math and the recalculations and the math uh, and, and it's a very personal choice so if you don't want to have a dose of math and, and thinking about the economics uh, in your game, maybe it's not for you. Understand that going in, that this is a large portion of what that game is. It's not all of it, but that is a large portion of what that is. Uh, because again and again, when you, when you look through the reviews of it, that's where it breaks down. It's you know people who love this game and people who hate how much math there is in this game. And it goes either way. What surprises me is there are lots of other games with way harder math. There's probably more in Power Grid, but all it is is adding and subtracting. You have paper money. There's as much math in Power Grid as there is in Monopoly. Like, it, maybe there's bigger numbers, but all you do is you get your money every turn by counting how many power plants you have, and then the banker hands you that money. And then when you're building roads, you add up the cost of all the roads you want to build on, and you pay that money to the bank. That's it. That's all the math there is in power. Well, there's, there's there's the forecasting aspect, which I think some people are, are you know, and planning uh, and, 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 well, and financial planning and how much money you've got versus how much you're going to be able to spend. And, and there's that that seems to be more the problem than the, you know, how okay. much money I get, how much. Money so I it's more the economics of the game than the actual difficulty of the math. Yeah. I mean, I, people can, you know, if they really need to, can throw down a calculator on the table. We all carry exactly. calculators with us, no matter what our teachers told us in grade school. <laughs> True enough. Uh, but you know, if you, if you don't want to be recalculating and thinking about the economics and how much you're going to have and how much you've got and you know what it's going to cost next round, then. Yeah, that, that, okay. That's a total, to me, that's something different. That just means you don't enjoy economic games as opposed to the math complaint. Cause yes, that's what the game's all about is, is trying to play the market and forecasting. Are you going to be able to get the coal or is someone else going to invest in it? And that's going to drive the prices up. And that's the whole point of power grid. You, you want to expand your network really quickly to get the choice spots, but then not be able to power the places. But if you do that, you end up in first place. And when you're in first place, that means you buy last and you bid in auctions first. And like, there's a lot going on. Like the complaints I often hear, though, is that, oh, it's too much math. It's to me, no, it's okay. It's too much economics. I, I starting to see the difference. It's just people aren't saying the same terminology. I would guess that it's the same people that don't like that, don't enjoy games like Steam, or probably wouldn't enjoy Brass because money in economics of Brass is what the whole game's about. Right. So Angie Games did make one note. I do mention this in the blog post. In the original Power Grid, you could. Um, market yourself out of the game. You could spend all your money on a power plant and then not have enough money to buy the resources to power that power plant. And if your power plant's not powered, you don't generate any more income and you're out of the game. There is a Power Grid Deluxe came out. I talk again, I talk about this on the blog post. That fixed it, sort of. It, it's a Band-Aid. All it is is if you don't generate any power, you get 10 whatever they call them, electro bucks. But there is no longer player elimination in the most modern version of Power Grid. All right. And again, you can read more on the on the uh, website. Now, each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. 
Now we also have lots of other places you can ask questions. I'm online on most social media sites. Just hit me up wherever you happen to find Tabletop Bellhop. And you can reach us pretty much anywhere. And if there's somewhere you're at, we're not, let us know. I'll make an account. I've got accounts all over the bloody web, so I don't see why not. That said, this week we are changing things up slightly again. But don't worry, we'll be back to answering your questions again next week. So due to Extra Life hitting this past weekend, I didn't have the time to write up a blog post answering one of your questions. I do apologize. Um, nor would I have had the time to do any research if I did have a question and time to answer it. So I just, I, I was busy. <laughs> I was very busy the last week. So instead of you listeners, the bellhop made last week about kids in need. This week, I've got a question for the bellhop. What is Extra Life and how did your event go? Well, there you go. That makes sense. So we do have a question. It's just it's, it's Sean's listening. It's a listener question. It fits. Uh, I may or may not do up a blog post on this. Probably not at this point. We talked about it a bit on a couple things. So Extra Life itself is a worldwide, mostly North American, but technically worldwide, 24-hour fundraising and gaming marathon to support Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. This was originally started in 2008 by some video gamers looking to raise money for a child named Victoria Iman, who was diagnosed with leukemia at age 11. Uh, the first year they ran it, they raised $302,000 for the Texas Children's Hospital, which is part of the Children's Miracle Network. They then expanded because the gamers that did this wanted to do it again, like if they they did so well, we're, I don't know, basking in their glory. I don't know how to word this, but they went, you know, this was great. We should do it again. And at that point, the Texas Children's Hospital was like, this is great, but why don't you spread it to the rest of the network? Like, let's start supporting the entire Children's Miracle Network. And when that happened, it went viral and it went global and it just went nuts. So the work these hospitals, like sick kids up here in Toronto, do is remarkable. Mm -hmm. The patient care and the research they do every day saves lives, but also costs a lot of money and that's where charities mm -hmm. like this can really come in and help uh help save kids yes yeah they their their third thing is like i don't know if you can see it here but it's play games heal kids um the day of the event they had a, a really good message sent out to everyone participating about like parents getting bad news like if you were in that situation or a child being born months early in it which is kind of the reminder of what we're gaming for and like a little pep talk to get us out there it, it was rather touching actually i shared it with our local group so speaking of our local group um here in windsor it was seven years ago when a local gamer jamie shepherd told me he's doing some kind of charity gaming thing and he's going to play board games for 24 hours and he wanted to know if we wanted to hook up with him during the his gaming time and play some games. Now, with short notice, I set up an event at the time through the Windsor Gaming Resource at a local game store called Cugan Immune, and fantastic store that sadly has closed. But it was really late notice, and people got confused over what the event was about and Facebook reading comprehension and Facebook events and store was only open certain hours. And we were also trying to do some other tournaments. It just didn't go that well as far as getting a bunch of people out. So Jamie did stop in at the store and there were a few of us there and we gamed with Jamie, which was kind of fun. And Jamie did the whole thing. Like he showed up, played some games with us. Actually, that's the, he introduced me to hamster roll during his first extra life event, a game I still love. Uh, I can't, we played some X wing cause X wing had just come out at the time. And I had the Hound solo millennium Falcon and we, we had a, we had some fun playing it. And then Jamie left and he stayed up all night and did the whole 24 hour thing, gaming with his kids. And I think he played some video games or whatever. And then to be honest, I don't even know how much money he raised cause it was something he did on his own. But what I saw was the potential to get the local gamers out and do this as a team next year. So I talked to Jamie about it. He's like, yeah, they have teams. You can create a team. So the next year I created the Windsor Gaming Resource team and we've done it every year since. So this past year, this past weekend was our sixth year in a row participating under that Windsor Gaming Resource banner. Now we've been mentioning this for a few weeks leading up and you've heard some of the numbers like $14,000 raised, but that was prior to this past weekend. That is correct. So as for how it went, um, it was a ton of work. It, it, 
Every year, it's more work than I expect it to be. Uh, it's always shocking to me. But it went very well. It, it was well worth it. Um, I don't think most of the local gamers or the people who just show up the day of the event realize everything that goes into it behind the scenes. So this year, I started late. Usually, I'm getting things moving a little quicker. Uh, things are still a little topsy-turvy here in the Tuzano household. So there were a lot of other things going on, so I just didn't get to Extra Life as early as I'd like. So I started about the second week of September. And at that point, I'm reaching out to people. So I'm trying to contact local companies, game stores, trying to find potential venues, uh, places to play. Who wants to take part? Who wants to host us this year? Like last year, we had three different venues, and we tried to have people show up at all three different venues. And it was a bit confusing. So we we're trying to find a, a central place this year. Uh, the other thing I start doing is looking for game companies, because over the years, we've had companies donate games for us to play or auction off during the event. And I'm also trying to reach out to friends and family for other uh, for donors, right, to start raising money. Now, charity events like this require a huge amount of time and effort by everyone involved. It's one thing to uh, set up a Twitch stream and play and take your donations and give those in. But when you're actually setting up an event at a location in person with people and food and all the requirements involved of, of getting groups of people together... Uh, it's a major event. I've worked behind the scenes in my entertainment career uh, for groups like Robin Hood Foundation, United Way, and others. Uh, major international events. And, and watching the work that goes into the events like that, or even events, smaller events like this, it's astounding that they happen at all. Uh, and without the support of people willing to give their time, knowledge, and effort, they just wouldn't. Yeah. No, it's definitely true. You need the help. So, which leads me to the next part. This year, usually Deanna and I do a lot of the work ourselves. Uh, this year we wanted help. Uh, we needed help. So we sent an invite to the entire Windsor Gaming Resource. So I, I've talked about the WGR many times. There is a Facebook group, a, a blog, and we have about 600 members in it. So that's a, a big part of the local community. Now, a lot of the members are just there to find out what local gaming events there are, uh, but others are more actively involved. So we had a meeting at Franco's Pizza, Italian place that's close to the two of the local game stores. And we talked about splitting up the work. Um, as part of that, what we did is we created an envoy system. So we got people to volunteer to approach local businesses. So I personally was working with Jeremy and Ian at the CG Realm. We had other volunteers like Jeff, who's in our chat room right now, who was approaching a local gaming cafe called Wizards of Walkerville. We had Cindy Smith was approaching Brimstone Games and so on. And we basically, everyone kind of stayed... Um, like had, had their own things to do, right? We had someone volunteer to make baked goods and we had this meeting, we had some snacks, sat down and hashed out a plan. Uh, sadly, all the other venues were turned us down. Um, CG Realm stepped up, were willing to host us and host us for 24 hours. Uh, the other places were all doing their own thing or weren't interested in taking part this year. To each their own, that's their choice. So at that point, it became just starting to coordinate things. And this is over weeks. So like every two weeks, we had another meeting at Franco's. We got that original group of people back and we're like, hey, Dave, did you get the flyers done? Oh, no, you didn't get the flyers done. Okay, I'll do the flyers. Hey, Sean, are you still going to hand out flyers at the university? Hey, Ryan, Ryan got me on TV. So thank you, Ryan. Ryan had me go down to St. Clair College Mediaplex downtown Windsor and did an interview with me, right? Like it was just Managing it, right? So it was coordinating things, prepping for the various giveaways, prepping for the auctions. Um, the auctions, like people don't realize how much work goes into that because we don't want to just throw a $5 opening bid on everything because we want to at least get, we, we want to make money for the kids. So we don't want to sell it. It's not meant to be a garage sale. It's meant to be an auction for charity. So there is a lot of work behind the scenes. NG Games does most of this of researching what stuff's worth to set an open an appropriate opening bid. Um, we had a ton of donations. So Jason Russell of Geektropolis Cafe uh, had moved down to Windsor with his family. A bunch of tragedies happens. He had to close his gaming cafe and basically give up his game collection. He was kind enough to donate over 50 items to us. So we had all that. Plus, donations were rolling in from local gamers. Uh, plus, personally, this is my way to purge my collection every year. So this is when I get rid of games. When I make room on my shelf, I donate the games to our after extra life auction. Now, 
all those items people buy, the games being played, food, businesses staying open, those just don't happen on their own. And she games mentioned CG, uh, uh, the game store was willing to stay open overnight as mm-hmm. well as take debit and credit credit payments for the auctions. And they absorbed those fees. Yes. It's not free to take credit cards and, and, and debit cards. And they took on that cost to themselves while we're passing on the full amount onto Extra Life. Yeah, which is fantastic. Like Jeremy, uh, Jeremy's one of the owners. Jeremy, Ian, and Tron really stepped up. Jeremy, I'm going to mention most often because he's who I liaison with, but really it's all three of them. Uh, fantastic job. Really, really helped us out. Like they, they gave us a place to play and were more than just a place. They, they were actively involved. Um, so we got in all these donations. Well, all those, we had to get the bids, Googling, filling out index cards, all stuff done so that the day of the event, we're not doing this, right? Otherwise, it'd be me and Angie Games off in a corner with a laptop where everyone else is playing games. Yeah, we were talking about, we were joking about Math the Game for Power Grid. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to auctions, Power Grid's got nothing on a real auction. And yes. not, only, uh, <laughs> not only a clash, classic auction, you know, with, with an auctioneer, which yourself, you yourself did, but you had a silent yep. auction as well. Um, so, you know, it's... I, you know, I think the uh, we'll get into it a little more later, but just the amount the amount of effort going in there, it's you're you're talking more than you know. It's it's not just five minutes a game. You need to mm-hmm. you need to take time on these items. Yeah, and there was there was sorting too, right? Like the stuff came in, and went, this was our first year doing a silent auction. And I'll I'll say it now, it went uh, better than we expected. I think overall, the silent auction. It's something we'll definitely do next year. A big part of that was to make my job as a live auctioneer easier because that's what kills me every year is the live auction burns me out. Right. It's a lot of work. Um, so being able to take out some items to, to not have to talk about them was, was a nice bonus and it raised good money. So I was, I was happy with the way that worked. It's something we'll definitely do next time. Maybe, maybe next year I'll take over and I'll be your auctioneer for you. I can at least, <laughs> I can at least let you sit down a little bit Boy, talking. I can do, I, you know, that's one, the one thing I, the one thing I can definitely do, I manage the stream and talk for you. There you go. I don't know. I got a lot of compliments on my auctioneering, I guess. People have commented on the videos and sent me stuff. I think someone actually asked us to highlight it. Yeah, if, like, you All wanna, right. if you want to catch it, you can uh, hop into our YouTube stream, and uh, we've got that highlighted, so that'll stick around uh, for posterity. Yeah. So there's all the auction stuff, right? But then there's all the promotional stuff. And, like, I tried. I, I'm not bashing the local gamers for this because if they don't have the skills and the time they don't have it but i really tried to find volunteers to do the photoshop work because i'm no pro at this everyone seems really impressed with what i came up with but like i had to design flyers and like i'm doing other stuff right and trying to fit this in this is one of the reasons i didn't get a lot of gaming in is we had flyers we had to do the cheat jars we had the instructions for cheat jars we had to do the facebook event pages we needed images for the event pages um and she games worked with our webmaster aaron who we've mentioned on the show again before hello aaron uh subscriber to the show uh fantastic woman and our webmaster helped make this amazing web page like if you go to windsorextralife.com they did all the work on that i helped fill the schedule in and i helped get some of the content for it but they did all the work fantastic job on that but that was all stuff that takes time right it all has to happen well uh, extralife.org provides resources for people yeah. organizing events but they don't hand it over to you. You still need to personalize it. You need to make it your event. So they, you've got some graphics and, and, and commercials and things that you can integrate into your event, but mm-hmm. there is no build a, build an event package that they hand you. Uh, it's, no, it's I, just a, a extra resources. I wish they did, though. Like, it's silly because they, they put the... I had already finished all our flyers, and then they put out the 2018 resources. This happens every year. Uh, and they put out a nice three-panel flyer, and I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. But, like, they didn't... Like, make it a form-fillable form where you can put in your club name or something. Like, it just... For, for a bunch of computer geeks who are running this thing, you'd, I expect a little more interactive, interactive uh, media, I guess, is the best way to put it. But anyway, uh, I made everything myself this year. Or like I said, Angie Games and Aaron worked on the web page. Uh, got some. They even got those the graphics. We own those, which is pretty awesome. She found some some awesome stuff that they were able to use. I dig it. It's nice. It's a. I, I love that we have a web page because now we own that. Like we own this web page, and that way we'll have it for next year too. So that's going to be a big step for next year. 
Um, so we got all this stuff, right? And then we have to get it there the day of the game night. So like this filled my van, like, and we tried to get everyone we could to donate the stuff right to the store because they had a space to hold it. But even with doing that, we still had a ton of stuff we had to bring over. Uh, next year, I recommend Uber or Lyft as a sponsor <laughs> of the <Sponsor>. event. <laughs> I, uh, it's not a bad idea. We could approach them. I doubt it would work, though, the way whole Uber, how it's kind of outsourced. <laughs> um, then, I don't know, this seems to be a perennial problem with Extra Life. Um, this is the first time it's happened at CG Realm. We got there. There's a lineup. There was literally a lineup outside. We took a picture, put it online. So, like, dude, there's people lined up to get in. Uh, by the time they opened the doors, there was at least 30 people in line to get into CG Realm to get gaming, which I thought was pretty impressive. Absolutely. So uh, seeing the interest in the event is is great. Um, it takes people to help people, and that's really what this event is all about. It's it's people, gamers in this case, helping other people. Yeah. So we get there. We get in the doors. There was a ton of setting up still to do. Uh, we had to figure out what to do with the auction stuff. So like. Jeremy had promised us space and tables, but like you still had to do it. You had, we had to physically move tables. We had to stack games. We had to organize, right? We had, we had to lay it out. We had to get the baked goods out. So that's one of the things we did is people donated baked goods and we sold them. Just general setup, right? Um, I got the stream working because I did try to live stream the entire event all 32 hours the store was open. I don't think I got 32 hours, but I still think I got about 28. It went fairly well. Uh, unfortunately, the battery on NG Games' laptop is not amazing, and it kept timing out on me. And then I also had a problem where I didn't realize one of the pillars that I was told had power. The power wasn't working. So I plugged it in thinking we were all great and filming Jeff's DCC game, and it ends up the thing was off the whole time. But anyway, we got the stream working. We got everything set up, and people started getting gaming now luckily the week before there was a little bit of testing and the uh, blessings of the <laughs> network gods meant that uh aside from some power cord management issues yeah. the stream was actually quite solid for much of the event uh i, yeah, I, I was, was impressed i was watching it for as much as possible and i know we had some of our regulars like shadzar dropping in uh mm -hmm. and doing some putting in some major hours behind it as well and uh <laughs> yeah shadzar was there I, I swear for the whole thing i was every time i went over to the laptop to see if anyone was chatting my original plan was to try to like focus on specific games and have my phone so i could chat with people it just didn't quite work out maybe it's something we'll improve on next year i've, I've got uh, some like, i've got some plans for next year so i think uh we'll we'll see what can happen and uh i think next year uh assuming i can get down there and I, we need to make sure we book that right away but i'm i'm sort of expecting that i'm not gonna game uh, I'm going to try and, and sort of be that, that media guy and, and just sort of help out, you know, and if I can, you know, do the auction and do the stream and, you know, if I get, a, if I get a game in great, but, uh, I really want to be down there to help the event and take some of the pressure off. Yeah. Well, which I'm about to get to, what generally happens is with organizing, I don't, I don't get a lot of time to game. So like I did get some games in, we'll get to them in a second, but what happens is overnight you end up playing games because there's just not that much to do <laughs> when it's overnight and the store is no longer busy. So starting early. So this is early Saturday morning, you know, 10 till noon games. I saw played now. I didn't play these. It's just some of the stuff that was going on. There was a uh, century golem edition was really popular. Saw that played a lot. Uh, the War Machine table was all set up and they were, Steve Joannis uh, was running an event uh, there for charity. He There was all kinds of scheduled events, actually. There was a Magic PB, PB and J, I don't know. I don't know Magic stuff. There was some Magic thing going on. Um, my friend Neil brought in his amazing looking copy of Feudum and set that up. Uh, Jeff was starting up a Dungeon Crawl Classics game. And the one table that I think impressed me the most the entire weekend was a group of D&D players. There were six of them. These were younger high schoolers. Like I, 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 I'd hate to get, guess their ages and be wrong. I'm going to guess early high schoolers. They went to Herman local school. They were setting up and they set up their table and they did not move. And they just played D&D &D the entire time like they put us all all us old guys to shame like it, it was impressive the dedication this group of younger gamers had to their DD &D campaign personally i didn't get a chance to play anything yet so i was still helping saying hi to people trying to figure out where stuff to go and oh my god matt blaze thank you for your donation but wow we did not need 200 movie posters <laughs> having to sort through those like what we'd done is we were trying to hang them on hangers so people could see them right so this is all the stuff we tried to prep as much as we could ahead of time but obviously there was still stuff to be done something always comes up last minute no matter what you do now yeah, uh, definitely I 
So, so, so this is, uh, did Jeff, uh, who's in our chat room right now, was that, yep. the, you, did he run that Dungeon Crawl, Crawl Classics pretty much the whole time? So what Jeff had was two Dungeon Crawl Classic games scheduled. So he had one scheduled for Saturday afternoon. I think it started at 11 or so. And it went long. Like, I had four to six hours. I, I was busy. Jeff is in the chat. I'm sure he'll tell us. Uh, he had a nice big group. I think he had five, six players, which was fantastic. People seemed very excited. He was up for a long time. But then he, he hung around for a while after. But then he left, and he came back at 4 a.m., and ran another group. And from what Angie Games tells me, that didn't end till like noon. Okay. Like they just like 4 a.m. to like noon playing Dungeon Crawl Classics. That was the game that people as other games finished kind of went over and migrated to that table. I noticed the group at first was like two players. And I look over next time, it's four players. I look over again, it's like six players. And anytime I couldn't find someone, I'm like, oh, where'd this first? Oh, they're playing Dungeon Crawl Classics now. And Dungeon Crawl Classics at that point is a very neat game because it's it's classic D, &D right like like tuma horrors D, D challenge like you're not gonna win almost impossible to beat dungeons filled with traps and the point is you are just peasants and you play peasants going into this and you play three to four characters each because your peasants aren't going to survive and the entire reason you play this part of the game which is called the funnel is that whoever survives is who levels up to become a level one adventurer. And that's who you play for the rest of your campaign. It's such a great concept. Like, I love this concept for DCC. And that's what Jeff did was he ran two funnels of DCC. So he's noting the first one was for five hours. The second one was an eight hour DCC funnel. So now normally this would be impossible because if you play DCC for five hours, I don't care if you make 40 characters are all dead, but we allowed cheating. And that was the secret to why DCC was so successful successful for us and in many ways this is the secret to how you can actually make money on board yes. games in a lot of cases <laughs> uh the, the 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 real feature of this is the cheat jar uh and this is yes. something this is something that twitch people are are familiar with but it's mm -hmm. a matter of you know you give money to affect what's happening uh whether it's on the stream or on the game in front of you um and so the sec that second game that eight hour game where he's 63 dollars in cheats um, nice. So that's that's one game, uh, just sixty three dollars from players wanting to uh, get a little better, get a little edge, or get a little better. Uh, Seventeen characters survive. See, if Goodman Games reads that, they may revoke your uh, organized play <laughs> license, Jeff. You may want to keep that one on the down low. <laughs> there we go. So I, it's like midday Saturday. I couldn't even tell you because I'm. It's, everything's kind of a buzz, right? And I'm like, I got to play something, right? Like part of this is like I, every now and then I feel bad. I don't know if I should, right? Like I'm raising money for Extra Life and raising money for Extra Life. I'm claiming that I'm gaming for 24 hours. I will fully admit I am not gaming for 24 hours. I'm running an event for more than 24 hours and gaming when I can. So I really hope and I do believe that anyone who is supporting me financially understands that. Like, if they, you have a problem with it, maybe next year I need to literally play more games. But, like, I, I'll get through the list. I think I played enough. But I do spend an awful lot of time organizing and not playing. But I need to play something. So, first thing I had to play was Azul. Not because Azul is awesome and I play it a lot. But on Friday, I finally got the Joker tiles. So, these are these really nice, translucent, clear wild cards that you can throw into your game of Azul. And this was my chance. I'm like, I get to try them. I got them Friday. I opened them up and I threw them in my box when I left on Saturday to go to the store. I dig it. Um, the Joker tiles are really neat. So when you go to draft your tiles, you could draft just a Joker or you can take a Joker and another color. And if you take the other color, you have to take all of it. Or if you take Jokers, you have to take all the Jokers. So you could grab the blue, or you could grab the blue and two Jokers, or you could grab just two Jokers, right, as an example. Then when you slot them, the Jokers jump to the front of your pattern, so they're the ones that have to go onto the grid. And all they do is they count as any other tile, but you give up the possibility of ever scoring those bonus 10 points for completing the color by having a joker there so you still get the columns and the rows but there's no way to get that bonus 10 points and man like it changed the strategy in a very good way i wouldn't say it made the game easier or harder it just made it feel different which i loved because it was still azul like you're still doing the exact same things scoring still the same the only thing we found was a problem at one point someone suggested flipping the board and i don't think you can use the jokers on the other side because like where would you put them 
because you don't know what colors they're representing. But I don't know. I'm sure – you know what? If I Google it or if I go on Board Game Geek, there's probably something there. Now, are these jokers enough to uh, tide you over until you can get your hands on uh, stained glass? I, you know what? The pictures I'm seeing of stained glass, I don't know. The reviews are positive, though. Like, it looks like things are in columns. It looks very different from Azul. Like, yes, there's tiles, but I, but I don't I know. I mean, you know, it's it's got uh, some good pedigree behind it. So It does. It does. <laughs> what I'm actually more excited to try is Reef. Reef is the newest game from the same designer as Azul that came out. And uh, it's a totally different game where you're building reefs, and it has to do with... Um, you're now thinking spatially in three dimensions instead of just a grid. And I think they're similar, like the, there's tiles in this, but they're funky. Uh, what do you call it? Coral. What are reefs made coral. of? Coral. Coral, thank you. I couldn't think of the, the word. And little pieces of colorful coral that you're putting on a grid. I don't know, it looks cool. I Personally, I want to try both. It's very pretty, I have to say that. <laughs> reef uh, yeah. reef is, a, is, a, is a pretty looking game, it, although it looks very childlike, so it'll be interesting. It does. It looks very plasticky, so yeah. I don't know. I, wa- I, mean, I want to try age, that one. Age is 8+, plus, community rating, so. Yeah. Um, the other thing that was going on here, there was, there was a ton of people playing Magic, and here was something I would have never thought of, would have never entered my mind in any way, shape, or form, but they're about to start the PB&J, and guy calls me over and he's like this here and he points at my camera he's like is this streaming and i'm like yeah it is he's like you gotta turn it off and i'm like what he's like well people can cheat this is a pb and j pbpt whatever it's the pro tour qualifier like this is the whole some people make money like make a living playing magic and while you have to enter these pbbgds to be able to move up to the next level so this was like official like there's a dude there in a magic suit and he's got his magic logo and he's got his you know i don't know maybe he's from watsi i don't know how these people get these jobs who was really unhappy that we were streaming his magic event I guess, like, I guess if it's that serious, someone's going to grab their phone and look at the stream to see the other guy's hand of cards. I don't know, whatever. So I had to move the stream. So that was the the first chance. I think I dragged it over to the War Machine table because at that point, Steve and uh, another guy, Dave Garby, who's down from Kitchener just for our event, which is pretty awesome, uh, we're playing their miniature battle game on the table. So I put that there. Uh, Neil was teaching Feudum, switched over. He was teaching Root. Root is huge. I wish I would have got to try that, but I knew if I sat down with a game to play with Neil, I'd be there for three hours. Uh, there were other card gamers there, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon. Um, there's a new one, Dragon Ball or something. One of the big anime licenses just put out a new CCG, and people are going nuts for it locally. Um, even the sandwich shop. So I haven't mentioned the sandwich shop yet, but uh, CG Realm is kind of split in thirds, I would say, where it's game store and one two-thirds and one-thirds... Uh, a sandwich shop, almost a soda jerk. They've got ice cream and floats and coffee and, and sandwiches. Uh, Sean, a different Sean. There's lots of Sean's in Windsor. I've mentioned that before. Uh, is the manager there and makes fantastic food. He was hopping. Like, he, he, it, it was busy. Yeah, this is, this is, of course, the sandwich shop who we have mentioned a number of times with Coney Dogs. So, yes. you know, that this, is, this is the same sandwich shop. I do have to admit, I did not have a single Coney dog during Extra Life because we went to CG Realm three times in the week leading up to Extra Life, and every time I had Coney dogs, there were I had a lot like of Coney dogs six on your, Coney on your dogs. Facebook stream. <laughs> yes, I had like six Coney dogs the week leading up to Extra Life. By the time I got there, I'm like, oh hell no! I did get to try the um, Sloppy Joes. So he does Sloppy Joe sliders. Uh, it, it's a homemade Sloppy Joe. They're exactly what you'd expect. It's it's Sean seems to be the master at nailing those traditional recipes, right? Like he nailed the Lafayette Street Coney Dog. He nailed the the Sloppy Joe. Uh, comfort food, fantastic comfort food. Um, but man, he was stressed. Uh, he did not expect the event to do that well. And even us in the background, I was really hoping it would do well based on the advertising we did, based on the fact that I actually got on TV, stuff like that. I thought it would be busy, but I couldn't tell them an exact number because we'd never run an event just at one venue like this. So Sean, I don't know why he did this, but he decided he was going to do the event himself and let his other staff off for the weekend. That was a bad call. Uh, so partway through the day, he was looking pretty stressed out and started calling for some backup. He managed to get a co-op student, but she couldn't come in until later in the day. So he was a little stressed out, but man, the store was doing good, which was good for us because they were donating a hundred percent of their tips for the day to extra life. And they are a 
kind of ridiculously well priced. I I, I don't want to <laughs> say cheap, but it, it kind of feels cheap place to eat. So it is. you know, if if they're giving up all their tips, that has got to uh that has got to touch them on the bottom line probably far more than any interact or credit card fees would. Um yeah. you know, because tips are tips are money in hand. It, they are. So at this point, things seem to be going pretty good. Um, there's a couple that usually does Brimstone game nights that I'd never seen in CG Realm before. So I went over to them. Uh, they were setting up King Domino. They looked lost. So I'm like, can I help you? And they're like, oh, well, we're trying to set it up. And I'm like, do you know how to play? They're like, well, we know how to play two player. I'm like, do you know how to play three player? And they're like, well, we don't have three players. So I sat down and I'm like, I'll show you how to play three player. I dig that game. Like King Domino is just fun. It's it's really simple basic game you're just matching colors um it's drafting and matching and the order you draft in is your turn order for next round so if you want that juicy tile you may end up going last really simple to score uh it's perfect for these kind of events because it's accessible to everyone so you can get a hardcore gamer will probably play king domino and be happy and you can get someone who walks it around the street and teach it in five minutes and they'll also be happy so i i, I was one I personally brought was there. It was my copy we played. And then I had to show off the Joker tiles because I knew this couple was into Azul because I'd played with them at Brimstone a couple times. And I'm like, wait, wait, I got to grab my copy of Azul. And what's funny is I couldn't get it because someone else was using it at a different table and I had to wait for them to finish. And then I had to go get it. Like, hey, and they're like, oh, is that your copy? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's mine. I need it. And then I, we played a game of Azul with the Joker tiles. So again, not a lot of gaming so far. Two different games of Azul and the game of King Domino. But we're about to get to the the highlight of your collection at the <laughs> uh, at the event, and and really, I think this this really could have been predicted uh, pretty easily um, based on based on how it's shown every other time you've pulled it out. No, I I do agree. So War Machine finish. So the thing with War Machine is they play War Machine. Actually, I should say Hordes. There's both games. Privateer Press puts out one game. One's kind of sci-fi. One's kind of monsters. Everyone who played on that table used Hordes armies this time. So technically they were Hordes. But anyway, it's a 4 by 4 table that's set up with a nice lip. And it's got a neoprene mat on it with like a generic uh, overland kind of pitcher. Um, and it's on wheels. And you can move this thing around. And it, it's great for playing war games that need a 4 by 4 grid or 4 by 4 uh, map. What I have wanted to play on that since I first got the game was Laser Riders. So the second War Machine finished, I'm like, Steve, Dave, they were the ones playing it, right? I'm like, you guys done? I'm like, they're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I got to show you something. They're like, what? And I take out Laser Riders, and we're playing it with these hardcore miniature gamers, right? Like, these are guys who just played through a War Machine tournament, sorry, Hordes tournament. And I'm like, we're going to play Laser Riders. And this was like the hit of the show. I Laser Riders got played more than anything else. I played it with, um, like I said, Steve and Dave. They loved it. There was another another guy there. He played it. Um, I think we played at least six times. There were times where I just looked over and I'm like, oh, people are playing <laughs> Laser Riders again. That game is so good. Like we talked about it before. This is basically Tron the board game. It is you are doing light cycles on whatever size table you want. This particular table is great for it. You're trying to collect these gems, jewels, I don't know, hexagonal things that are out on the board by racing over them. And if you run into anyone else's laser trail or your own, you're not removed from the game, but all your things go away and you got to start over. You know what? We've, we've, again, we've talked about it before. The look and feel of this game, the graphic design of this game puts it over the top. It would be a crowd pleaser if it were a bad game, but it's yeah. not a bad game. It's actually a really good game. And I think four by four is probably an ideal. Uh, we've, yeah. we've tried it on a six, on a six foot round and it was just no, was... the wrong size. Uh, but I think four by four is a, is a really strong size for that game to play in. Yeah, I've said it about this game before. When I bought it, I expected the gimmick. I expected this, look, it's neat, it's light cycles, it looks cool, and it'd be fun. And, you know, and then I put the game away, and at New Year's, Sean comes down. I'm like, Sean, check out this game, it's light cycles. And you're like, oh, it's kind of neat. That's what I expect. And that's what you. it looks like. You look at it, you're like, it's gimmicky. Everything's 80s and bright colors, and there's holograms. Like, who's seen holograms in the last 20 years? All of the pieces are coated with holograms. That's part of the aesthetic of the game. Pokemon but it's players, actually so. a good game. Oh, true. Card, collectible card players uh that's true no it, it's it's solid it is a good game um century golem edition is probably one of the other games that got played 
almost as often. I saw that played at least two more times. Um, then I went shopping. Um, I felt like playing Terraforming Mars, and I did some research, and CG Realm had a fantastic price on it. So I picked up a copy of Terraforming Mars Venus Next, finally. Um, read the rules quickly, fairly simple. Adds a new board, which has a new terraforming track, but it's not uh, game-ending dependent. So the terraforming track on Venus can get as far as you want. It can get to the end, it doesn't end the game, or you could finish the game and it's only at level two. But every time you raise it, your terraforming rating goes up in the main game. So it's a way to get additional income and basically up everyone's score a bit. There's a pile of new cards. Um, I think six new corporations. I got this all set up. I read the rules. Um, I got things ready to go but i was supposed to run worldwide wrestling at three o'clock and i didn't see anyone there to play worldwide wrestling and i wasn't sure and I, at that point i was also starting to have a problem with my eye which i'll get into a bit more and i just i didn't really i ended up backing out i didn't play terraforming mars i wanted to but especially with five players that's a time commitment um so Angie Games did play. Um, she's talking about it in the chat right now. If you were here live, you could see her thoughts on Terraforming Virus, Venus Next. It looked good. I got to admit, I'm, I'm still itching to try it. I, I do want to see this expansion. I, I was impressed by what you got for the price. I, there were more cards in there than I expected there to be. Now, the concern that uh, Angie Games is bringing up is uh, it's, uh, there's too many cards, and it's watered down the deck, making it harder uh -huh. to get your combos. Um, so that's, that's a concern. Now scores went higher because you've got more scoring options. Um, but, and, and again, she points out that it was a dis long distracted game. This is an event, uh, and she had to step away at times. So she's mm -hmm. willing to give it a second chance. Um, but, uh, initially, uh, uh I initially, uh, some, some concern about it, I guess. So we'll, okay. we'll see, uh. We'll see on yeah, future sure. plays how it goes when you're not uh, <laughs> when you're not distracted and paying to cheat as a matter as well. Yes. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I could see that uh, watering it down though. Maybe it just means it's better with the drafting variant because I found with the original game it's better with that. So we'll see. I, I'm definitely. I'm sure I'll play it more often. So as for wrestling, unfortunately, no one showed up which was kind of a good thing because at this point my eye really started to bug me. I had no idea what was up. It hurt like enough. I almost left the event to go to the hospital. Um, it, it was, it was bad. It was starting to swell up. Uh, at that point, one of the local gamers, Cindy came up and was like, Hey, do you want to play tiny Epic zombies? And I got to admit, I'm not a big zombie fan and I've never tried any of the tiny Epic games, but all I wanted was a distraction at this point. I'm like, I don't want to think about my eye. Playing a game is probably a good thing because just walking around the store, watching people play games and trying not to rub my eye was driving me nuts. So I sat down with uh, Cindy and Doak and they taught me the game. So one thing that they point out right away is they had the Kickstarter edition. So there was, I don't know what comes in the base game and what came in this game but man there was a lot of stuff in that little box like there's a reason they call them tiny epic yeah there's a lot of stuff in a tiny box um there was a ridiculous number of characters to choose from and then they pointed out there's like five ways to play so like you can play uh co-op which is what we did you can play completely competitive you can play teams you can play one versus many and i think you could have played the zombies or something somehow there were five modes so i can only think of uh, four offhand cooperative team play with game controlled zombies Cooperative team play with zombies controlled by a non-team player. Competitive free-for-all with game zombies. Competitive free-for-all <laughs> with zombie player. And solo. Wow. See, that's a lot. That's a lot of ways to play a little game. Uh, we tried the co-op. It was okay. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the theme, I will admit. Uh, we did have a lot of rule issues. Like, stuff... Like, they obviously have played this before, but it, like okay, wait, my ability says I can do this. Does that mean I can do this? Or, wait, this zombie's got to move next. Does he move here or does he move there? Um, also a lot with stuff. So in the game, you have three, you do three moves. So you move your dude, your meeple, three times. And at the end of every move, you do an action. And now those actions can be kill a zombie, which is the most common. Uh, shoot a zombie, sorry, which uses up ammo. Uh, engage the zombie in melee, which means you roll this die to see if you get hurt while you're doing it. 
or use the rooms action. So each of the different rooms, I guess we were like running around a mall. They kept calling the part the card shops. It's, it's so a it was mall. like restock the shop. Yeah, mall, malls and it, zombies go together. It's you're yeah. not a zombie fan, so you wouldn't. But but mall, malls and zombies are a very very interlinked uh, trope. So you could use the shop, and then after you did your things, you had a card, and most of them were items, and you would flip the card up. And if it was an item, and here's where I didn't, like, I just listened to what they told us. So it was like, if there's a purple, then you pick it up and use it right away. But if it's a blue, it goes in the room. And then there was some kind of zombie boss. And the zombie boss had a rule that if someone was in the room, the thing rotates 90 degrees to the next shop or something. Like, it it just... There were rule issues. I, I let Cindy and Doak, and they, I wouldn't say argued about it, but even they had some differing opinions on how some of the rules should have been in, 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 interpreted. So overall, it was kind of, eh. It looks like a Kickstarter. Like, my bullets were tracked by a little wooden meeple that looked like a bullet. Not only that, like, the thing's, like, pro- not even a centimeter long, and it was screen printed with, like, it looked like a bullet instead of just being bullet shaped. The little zombies were little tiny green guys and they were all painted too. The meeple are plastic, but you can put equipment on them. So at one point in the game, I found a shotgun and I could actually put the shotgun in my meeple's hands. There was a little uh, wooden police car because there was one spot where you could jump into a police car to move around the mall quicker. I know there was lots of bits, the mix of wooden plastic, the lots of neat stuff, but I don't know. The game, kind of left me wanting it, it was okay and again you, you we've said in the past and you've you've stated out right that you're not a big zombie fan no. i have to say i it does look interesting i i think the uh the meeples with hand oil with, uh, with the ability to hold things is a great little uh it's a, gimmick, yeah, it's a nice but touch. it's a fun gimmick and i do have to admit it's a hundred percent a gimmick because you have the card in front of me, you for that weapon. Yeah. And any other game I've ever played, it's just oh, what equipment you put it in front of you, right? Like the ability to put that gun on there didn't really affect gameplay at all. But it looks cool. I do agree. So after that game ended, I, again, I couldn't even tell you it, it was gotten dark out. That could have meant it was five. That could have meant it was eight. I'm not sure. Uh, probably around five thirty or so, because I think that's when the magic PB and J ended. Uh, they started to go. War Machine had wrapped up. Um, pretty sure someone was playing laser runners on the war machine table. Um, I got with Tori and Kat and, oh, I feel so bad. I can't remember this guy's name. He only recently moved to Windsor and is one of, uh, very excited about heavier games and into the more epic games. I really enjoy playing games with this guy. He's a good competitive player who's into the kind of heavier games I like. No, uh, Anchi Games mentioned Chad. No, it's the guy who always plays with Chad now, because Chad's also into heavier games. He's from... Oh, I feel bad that I can't remember this. It's from, like, the Sioux or somewhere. Somewhere not Windsor. But anyway, I uh, played with him, and I finally got to play my copy of Mackie Stack. So I did the unboxing, and I talked about how I played it with the kids. Well, I got to play an actual team-based game, which was really neat. So in this game, you got sushi pieces and they're made of wood little wooden blocks and you flip a card and the card shows a stack of this sushi so there's like the bowl a piece of maki a piece of i don't know a california roll whatever it's all these different things and a little bottle of soy sauce you flip a card and your team has to stack them but then there's a trick to it when you flip the card if it's yellow you have to play chopsticks mode and what this means is that you and your partner each only get to use one finger And you have to work together so that you have your partner on one side and you on the other trying to manipulate these pieces, which, oh, my God, it's way harder than you would think because you trying to manipulate the piece and then manipulate the piece. And you're only using one finger, they're only using one finger. Wow. Uh, So you have to play chopsticks or if it's red, one of you has to wear a blindfold and the other player has to tell you how to manipulate the pieces. And those are the two ways you play. And you just flip cards, and the first team to get six cards wins. Very simple, but holy cow, were we laughing. Like, this was a great game. I completely forgot about any physical discomfort I was in while playing that. Though I was thinking, man, maybe I shouldn't be putting this blindfold on because I hope my eye is not infected or something. <laughs> that did pass my, pass my mind at the time. But then the components to this game was really neat because, like, the... The, the stuff like my kids have all this Melissa and Doug play food. This stuff is as nice as the Melissa and Doug play food. Wow. Nice. Um, so uh, it, it was still a strong game, even with grownups play, playing as teams compared to uh, oh, your yeah. adults. 
Okay. Yeah, like when we played with the kids, we just we each did our own chopsticks, and it was pretty right. simple, right? No, with teams, it would be fun. I have a feeling this would be a good one on the uh, pub list as well. And, and I believe, just just for posterity's sake, it's Pro Tour Guilds of Rav, uh, Ravnica. So PTGR, I believe, is the magic uh, initial. PTGR? is. It seems to be the current uh, tournament from... So I, th- I swear it was like PPT. I, I, I don't they, know. They have a lot of tournaments, so it is yes. really hard to tell. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm The Magic players are probably all cursing me. <laughs> That's okay. We're a board game show. They can. <laughs> so we're tabletop. We play okay. card games. You're too. right. I've got. I have, I have nothing against Magic. I've got hundreds we, of illegal Magic, magic cards. Magic. I've got hundreds of illegal Magic cards in the closet behind me. Uh, yep. Not one of them are yep. uh, useful. No, I am. I, I'm all good with the Magic players. I'm, I you. I hope they realize I'm joking when I call it the PB and J. I just can't remember. It's definitely PPT. It's like Pro something qualifier. I don't know. Sure. PPTQ, PTQ. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. Uh, up next was the auction. Uh, it was long. It burnt me out. Um, we had 144 items. Uh, thankfully, Jeremy had a mic, so that helped a bit. I wasn't very good at using it because it's a, it was a directional mic, and you had to hold it up to your face, and I'm not used to doing that. Uh, it, it went well. We raised over 2000 bucks on the auction, uh, which is fantastic. Uh I was burnt out. Uh, I did get to keep my voice. My eye was still driving me nuts. Like I, it felt like like the last thing I remember doing before it started is I had picked up a Tim Hortons sour cream glazed donut, and I swear I got sour cream glaze in my eye. I was pretty sure that's what was going on. Now, I had already tried to rinse for over five minutes, and it hadn't helped, so I didn't know what was going on. So at this point, I actually kind of chilled. Like I, I finished the auction i sat down and talked to people and socialized and i think at that point maybe at some point i got i got the sloppy joe sliders that might have been then i don't remember i remember eating half a slider and splitting it with energy games but yeah at that point i was like i'm done this is the every year after the auction i'm like i'm ready to go home (laughs) so now we again we mentioned it before but we have a highlight of the auction on our twitch video on demand if you'd like to check that out um that was the fun part of it what you don't see is the hours it takes to price and ready 143 <laughs> yeah. items for the auction. But what we got out of that, or what Extra Life got out of that, is, as Anchi Game says in the chat room, $2,228. Nice. Um, yeah, it was up there. And I see Blood Boiler has finally put, that's a PPTQ. There we go. Preliminary Pro Tour Qualifier. I knew it was PP something, PPT, right. PPTQ. I still say it's the PB and J. There we go. <laughs> so eventually, like once I'd rested, um, I had brought something I really wanted to show off and I thought would be good to stream was Big Trouble in Little China, which we tried to play. Why well, should we successfully played? We just tried to stream for our launch party. I bought the game hoping to show it off this was to me another perfect place to show off this epic game now this game is epic it's long like it's it's surprisingly long it's almost like playing two games so and she games started playing with us um she was egg shen i was eddie um tori and cat played with us yes that's the couple we usually play gloomhaven with uh tori was grace and no, sorry. Cat was Grace. Tori was Jack Burton. So that was our, our players. Um, and she games. Deanna managed to stay in for the beginning of Chinatown, but had to tap out, which was expected. So I mentioned this when we we're leading up to Extra Life. The goal of Extra Life, if you are participating in raising money, is to game for 24 hours. Nowhere does anyone expect you to game for 24 hours straight. Yes, many people do that, but that is not a requirement. There's no reason to make yourself sick or ill or hurt your own health for the sake of someone else's. You don't need to be stuck in your own version of the hospital for helping another one. It's just dumb. And we encourage this for everyone. Yes, I get it. People want to do the full 24. Like that D&D table, I should have mentioned a couple times, they're still going at this point. They haven't stopped. I think when we started Big Trouble in Little China might have been when they finally switched DMs, but it was still all the same players. They're going strong. They're they're good to go. They're younger than I am. <laughs> they can get away with it. So it was fully planned that, that NG Games had a pillow and a blanket in our van and was 
planning on taking a nap outside. So this isn't any bash on her for tapping out, because trust me, when I get a little further in the story, I'm about to do the same thing. <laughs> oh, Now, I guess uh, some people were saying that uh, it started off with a little confusion on the dice uh, system, uh, but uh, it came around to it. I think really that game to me, and I know uh, you just had a little bit of a, a, a trouble with it at the uh-huh. first time, it really needs uh, a round or two of playthrough to yes. get everyone comfortable with how the dice mechanic works. Because as soon as you've you've done it a couple of times, oh, okay, yeah. well this makes sense. But it, it need, the game needs that 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 round or two pre play mm-hmm. because explaining it doesn't always catch. There's there's going to be yes. there's going to be a percentage of people out of every single group who don't get it that for when yeah. you, if you just explain it. So, yeah, no, I agree completely. It's just, it's not an intuitive dice system. I think that's the problem. Like, you want to use body to fight, and you want to use mind to make skill checks. No, that has nothing to do with it. All you're actually figuring out is if your dice are epic or not. Like, it's it's weird. And if you haven't played it, you don't get it. And the the biggest one is Tori had a hard time with it. He was doing the exact same thing as you. She's like, I don't have any body, so I can't move. But then it was funny, because at the end of the game, Tori's like, man, that system's really tight. It's really simple. I really dig how easy it is. And I'm like, I don't know if you remember the beginning of the game, but you are having a hard time with it. Yep. Yeah. So no, it-, it, it was good. Like we, we played through, um, we focused on quests. So different. We did better than when we played at, at the launch party. It definitely went a little better. Um, we focused on quests and only beating up lone mooks that were around. Uh, we did end up at one point where someone got surrounded, but immediately had that person run into an alley. Because this is something, I don't know if we played this wrong the first time, but the minions won't follow you in past any red lines, so into any of the buildings. They'll just hang out at the door. And I can't remember if we knew that the first time or no, not. We, we Yeah, we, we did know that. The problem was we had made so many poor decisions that allowed so many groups of bad guys to to position themselves right. uh, that it was it was just wrong. And again, we, we talked about this before, but we had the wrong mindset for sitting yeah. down and, and getting into that game. And it sounds like that you guys sort of corrected that error <laughs> and me. really made the uh, made 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 the uh, the game play the way it was supposed to play. Yeah, I think so. Um, so we actually like you put in a main quest for each of the four characters and you put in one for one of the three storms. And as far as I remember, we completed three of the main quests and we were partway through another two. No, we must only finish two because we didn't get to see the the storm one. So we finished two main quests and we're partly through two more. And I think we finished three to four side quests. So we actually got to see a lot more of the story and the book, the, the, the which way book, the adventure book or whatever it's called. And man, Tori, Unfortunately, was playing Jack Burton because he should always read Jack Burton from now on. I'm like, we need Tori here just to read. Good, because you were so tired, and and I did actually hear you try your Jack Burton on the stream. Oh yeah, I tried. Uh, that was not <laughs> that that wasn't uh, wasn't a strong that impression. <laughs> Post auction, dude. My egg shen was the worst. I'm like, I could not do an egg shen. Well, oh, I missed the, I missed the egg shen. I heard oh, your, I heard was... your Jack Burton attempt, and it wasn't pretty. The uh... the Jack was great compared to the egg shen. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. Anyway, so one of the things we did I didn't really get the first time we played is there some odd stuff in this game. Uh all stuff that seems to be added to make it more of a board game, right? More accessible. Like the way anyone could finish a quest was jarring. So the rules are the actual character needs to start the quest. But then anyone can finish it. So there was some really weird stuff where like Egg Shen went to a dojo and challenged a master, and then left, and Grace went in and fought the master, but then the story talked about how the master bows to Aang Shen and hands him something. Like, it just, it, it, the, the suspension of disbelief is just gone. It becomes pure mechanics, and that felt weird. The oddest one, though, like, story-wise, was when you hit the, when the audacity track and the big trouble track meet and you flip to the, the final showdown, right? So in the game, basically, you start off, you're in Chinatown and you're leveling up. You're playing out scenes of the movie to get your characters into good enough shape to challenge Lopan. Sounds cool, right? Like, that's basically the first half of the game. Uh, 
so we're there, and I'm playing Eddie, and I'm trying to kind of find Mao Yin, right? So if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Well, I've gotten to the point where I know she's at the brothel. My next move is to go in there and rescue her, but we hit the time to flip the board. So it's just, oh, I guess I forget about Mao Yin. Let's go fight Lopan. Like, it just, it was weird. And it, you don't get that closure of finishing that quest. I, like, I guess my character didn't care anymore. Like, eh, time to go fight Lopan. Well, I mean, I suppose you could argue that, well, if you don't beat Lopan, Melvin's going to die, so you have to go beat that. Yes. And, but, it, yeah, it, it's definitely a, a bit of a stretch. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's a little rough. So the final battle, the other side of the board. Now, like, at this point, I think we played for two hours. Like, this is an epic game. Like, and then we still have a whole other sword of the bide. Sword of the bide? Whoa. Side of the board to go. Um, and this side of the board completely changed the feel of the game because now it's just a beatdown. There's no quest. There's no role playing. There's no making choices. It's to feed them off mooks, to get the keys, to go to the floor where Lopan is with his bad guys, with his his entourage, beat up Lopan because at this point he's a ghost and then he becomes real. And then you have to go up to the third floor and beat up the real version. So I it went okay, but we ran into a rule issue. So when we were spawning the minions... In the room with Lopan is one of the guardians, the weird-looking beholder things. But then when Eddie, I think it was me, uh, got my quest, I had to defeat three minions to be able to get a key. Well, there are only two minion minis left. And now there are rules for what to do when you can't spawn, and it just has a little hierarchy of what you spawn instead. But there was no way for me to ever complete that quest. So that kind of something that we didn't see before. Um, we did have a few other things too that came up uh, as we played. So, like when you go to a spot and activate it, it says skill check six. Do you have to do that right then? Because otherwise, there's a really dumb strategy where you go to the point where you're going to start the quest, but then wait till next turn to start it. So you dice refresh. That just seems mechanical, awkward, and out of theme. Uh, another one is you've got the quest cards, and you can see those because they're out on the table. But when you're looking in the book, it'll say stop reading. Are you then allowed to look at the quest card to see what skills you're going to need? Or is that supposed to be hidden information, right? Like there's just little rules, things that didn't come up the first time we played because it was very late, I guess. I don't know. Uh, seemed to come out more in this one. So the uh, Board Game Geek file section has mm -hmm. a very large PDF on this game. Um, okay. They have uh, sticker updates for 12 different cards at least. Sticker updates, including, wow. Including Lopan. Uh, there's, a, there's a misprint on Lopan himself. Uh, and 10 different rulebook changes that I found. Okay. Um, so I, I think you need to, uh, you know, before you play again, you might want to take a look at, uh, at the, the file section of Board Game Geek because this game is problematic. It, uh, yeah, and, and the designer acknowledges it. They they're working with the the, the crews in the forums to uh, catalog all of the various concerns, which is so a shame. Goes, but at least they're paying attention, I guess. <laughs> this goes back to our special Kickstarter episode, right? Here's another game that rushed out and skipped the development phase, right? Designer designed the game published the game and totally forgot that whole development and playtesting yes. step. It and I think great. it's obvious. It, it, it's got, there's a lot of aspects of it that have that feel of the movie, but yeah. it doesn't play well. Well, see, that's just it though. We still had a ton of fun. It does. Like it's thematic. But, it, but it is ridiculously it, thematic. But if you don't love the movie, would you, like, yeah. if you don't even know the movie, would you Well, yeah, there's no reason to play this game? I mean, that's the, you know, we, we have, have for years and years loved passionately this movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so our opinions of this game are definitely colored as a result. Yeah. See, overall, I'd say it was fun, but it's not a good game. Not as written. Maybe that the, the board game, Geek, I'll definitely play it again, even how it is. I'd play it again. But I think, yeah, going on board game, Geek, trying to find the differences seems like it's worth taking a look into. Um, Ah, that's uh, yeah. I'll try it again with the yeah. full rules. So at this point, the D and D group still going. Um, that, okay, so it was after we finished Big Trouble. They swapped. Uh, these kids were awesome. Like, like I said, they just kept going. I noticed Jeff had noted 
that they were there at 7 p.m. tonight playing D&D again. So this is a group that must go to CG Realm all the time and play. Fantastic. And I got to admit, at this point, I'm jealous because they, they were going good. And I I'm, was ready for bed at this point. <laughs> Uh, it, it sounds like they were a well-organized crew. Angie Games was mentioning that uh, various parents were dropping in with meals and, and uh, talking about the dragon that they bought them so that they could kill the party. Uh, <laughs> nice. So uh, I, I'll, the only thing I have to say is I would struggle with the idea of swapping DMs. I mean, you've got to be on the same page to run a game with two DMs. It was uh, two campaigns. Two uh, different campaigns. okay. The, the one was, I couldn't tell you, they told me. It was two modules, like they were published books they were running. And it was one DM who runs one campaign, and then they switched over to Horde uh, of the Dragon was one of them. Okay. So they swapped they swapped games, really. They were still playing D&D 5th Edition, but it was two different campaigns. Okay, that makes more sense. Because I was thinking, I mean, you could do two DMs for a single game, but you yeah. guys, you have to be on the same page for that in a big way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, one of the big late night games was, again, Ra- Laser Riders. Uh, this was the most epic long game of laser riders because man, were we cutthroat? We actually had, uh, they've Sean's played the game before. When you claim a jewel, another player, that's the only time you can cross over their laser thing is through a jewel. And when you do that, you steal it from them. Well, we had a three way cross. Like I, I shared a picture of this on Facebook and my Instagram and that you got to check this out where we basically like someone made got the jewel, then someone crossed over the jewel and then I snuck in and went between both of them and did that. It was awesome. There was tons of stealing stuff. And like I said before, like Laser Riders was kind of the star of the show. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Ian was kicking himself that he couldn't find a copy to have in stock because I think he would have sold a few of them, sold a few of them that night. Well, and I have to say, especially when you get into that late, late, late night, the yeah. the the bright colors, the actual you know <laughs> large pieces, um, you know, it's uh, it, it definitely sort of s- scores in something like that. You wouldn't want to be playing something like uh, the Penguin game where you're trying to have you know actual you know, dexterity. <laughs> But uh, I, I did bring Pitch Car to play, but it didn't get broken out. I, I had hoped to play that at some point. Yeah, no, the, the, the large, bright, tactile uh, gaming late at night works fantastic. So uh, up next, played some Laser Riders, and then two of the gamers who were there overnight were Dave and Bill. Uh, they were people who were at my place for Thanksgiving when we played Fallout. And as I mentioned when I talked about that week in review, whenever that was back in October, uh, we never got to finish our game of Fallout. So I owed Bill and Dave a full game of Fallout, and I knew they'd be here, so I went and brought my copy of Fallout. Um, Dave actually has tried to play twice. So once we set up a game at Brimstone and the store closed early, so we had to call the game. And thanks gaming, we had to call the game. So Dave's gotten screwed twice out of this. So he finally got to see the full game. Now, this is a love. I like everyone has a love hate relationship with this game, including myself. Some stuff is fantastic and some is so not. I love the way the cards work. I love the way you put out a simple quest on the board and there's two choices. And then once you do that, it starts branching. And then once that first quest is complete, two new quests come out. And that second quest might branch into two more quests. And eventually you may have five different quests going on on the board at once. And then when you interact with the quest, the player to your left is going to read it to you. And they're going to give you options. And you're not going to know the results unless you played the game in a lot and memorize some of the cards. But in general, you're not going to know the results of what's going to happen. And when you explore a site, it's the same thing. When I explore the wasteland, the player to my left takes the wasteland deck, draws the top cards, and is like, you run into a super mutant getting whipped by an overlord the mutant looks like he's near death do you intervene or do you ignore it and go shopping and people make these decisions and then the best part is if you sit there and save that super mutant you get a little chit on your guy that says you're now oh it's the opposite of vilified vilified's the bad one i forget what the good one is but whatever you're idolized so you get a little idolized chit, and then later in the game, something might come up, and it'll say, if you're idolized, you get this reward. Or there'll be something like, there's a dog, do you help the dog escape? And then you'll go grab a card from this deck of 180 cards and pull out one card and shuffle it into the encounter deck so that later you can find the dog again. Like, it's really well-done mechanics to simulate the actual story of a Fallout game. I love the side quests. I even like the dice system. The dice system uses the whole, um, what do they call it? The, this, 
Oh, Fallout has the, the special. You stop. No, or that's vats. the stats. It's, it's Sorry, the, vats. The, vats. That's the stats. But the vats, yes, the vats system. So you roll the dice and it shows if you hit a head or arms or the legs. Like it actually emulates it really well. And leveling up is cool. Like Sean mentioned, the special thing, you only start trained in two. And it, once you get XP, you just jump to the numbers you have. And if you get to the end of the list, you get a new number. So it, the more skills you have, the longer it takes to level up. Very awesome. But then the end of the game is ridiculously bad. Like it's dumb. It has nothing to do with the actual quests that are going on. It's just a race to eight points points based on arbitrary cards that you get for completing some of the quests arbitrary cards that have nothing to do with what you did in the quests yeah no the uh the end game on this is is a huge negative that i see a lot of sort of yeah. just vitriol and and anger about um the stolen the stolen quests much like in the problem we have you have with uh um a big trouble you know you st this whole stealing quest things is worse and it's worse because it's not cooperative <laughs> it's correct um that is true and then uh, you know you you like the dice and and the the vat system whereas a lot of people are really hating on the random nature um no, it's... That, that, yeah, there's i mean there is we, we've never really discussed this but there's a whole segment of the board gaming uh community who despises excessive randomness and oh, I think a I lot agree. of people, a lot of people feel that uh, this game suffers from that. Now I got to say, when you're playing Follow, like this is the whole Euro game versus Ameritrash or Ameritrash, whatever. I personally like Ameritrash. It sounds a little less negative. Um, general thematic American games are all about the dice and randomness, and I got to say, Follow lands on that side. If you don't want randomness, that's where you play your power grids, right? <laughs> to me, like, I, I, I'm surprised people who dig Fallout are complaining about dice, but hey, uh, I think it's just, it's a group of passionate fans that expected more from a game and are going to complain about lots of little parts of it, myself included. Because then there's the other problem, which I brought up every time we talk about this game. It's the, you had the shit, oh, <laughs> close, almost. You have the terrible game where you're just bad. You draw bad, you get left behind, you watch everyone else have fun, and you get nothing. You never level up, you never find any loot. Every time you go to the store and go shopping, there's nothing to buy. This happens too often. The game we played at Extra Life, there were four of us playing, two of us got the bad game where we just watched the other people playing. There was no chance I could have won that game. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's odd because I actually don't see complaint specifically about that so i'm not sure if uh people are just accepting of it and uh you know oh it's part of the luck based aspect Maybe. of it or if something is happening in the way you're playing it so it, it's hard to say i don't know i i think the thing is though is it only happens about 25 percent of the time so if you try the game and have already decided you don't like it for all the other reasons you're never going to see that or the first time you play that happens, you're not going to realize that it's only happened sometimes. So you're just like, oh, this game's dumb and random. I don't know. I, I It is definitely a problem with the game, and it has happened many times. But know what I don't get? I still love it. I don't know what it is about this game that keeps bringing me back. Like, I know my game could suck. There's like a 25, it might even be 33% chance that I'm not going to be able to do anything. I, I'm going to watch other people win. And that's what happened at Extra Life. But I play and I'm like, man, oh, I got one of the bad pulls this time. But maybe next time I'll get to see more of the deck. I don't know what it is. I love this game for no good reason. Despite all its flaws, there's something about this game that just keeps pulling me in. And, and you know what? There, you aren't the only one. Uh, a lot of people really seem to like it. It's got a solid, if not spectacular rating. Um, really, try this one solo. Um, <sighs> because everything is pointing to this being... A solo game. It it doesn't. It's not even a one or two players. It's it's listed as a one player best mm -hmm. game. Uh, and I oh, it's think, listed as that too. Oh yeah, no. I, it's I mean the the community has spoken very clearly. <laughs> this is a solo game with options to play more players. And I think what you would probably find is while you won't always win, you don't have the problem of one player being left out because you're either you're the player. <laughs> so you're either going to win or you're going to lose, but you don't have to worry about that extra player being left out. Now, I mean, we also know you're not a big solo fan, but it does seem that that is 
the key and you know knowing the game as i you know playing video game it's a solo game so maybe this isn't surprising well maybe when fallout 76 comes out and it's no longer a solo game they'll figure out how to fix the board game well apparently there are uh um some things coming out so like uh expansions coming out for it so yeah. Yeah, I've been looking forward to those, actually, to see if they fix some of these problems. A lot of people are. <laughs> yeah, I don't doubt it. So Dave, one of the, the guys I taught, Dave Hutchinson, noted something he wanted to try. And I have a feeling playing solo, because I don't think there's any solo rules in the box. So I don't think you can lose if you play solo. I think you just play until you've completed all the quests. It would be more of an experience. I, I think it's possible to not be able to finish the, the main quest or something. Oh, okay, maybe. So. But anyway, Dave's Dave's theory was we should sit down and just play until we finish the quest. Like, basically play co-op. Toss out the scoring and just play until you finish all the storylines. Now, I think that'd be fun, but once you do that once, I, now there's no reason to play the game. Because that is one of the things that keeps bringing me back is I never do get to figure out what the railroad's going to do or if the synths escape, right? Because it gets there, it gets there, and then the game ends because someone wins. And I'm like, oh, but I think that's part of what keeps bringing me back is i want to go back in and try it so and I one thing i, one I, thing I, I worry you ruin the replay of the game yeah one one thing i saw is there are a lot of different scoring mods for this okay. game people have gone i mean i everyone seems to be rewriting this game because everyone wants to like this game oh uh, yeah I, and everyone it's so close really wants like to like it and uh, and the effort that the community has put into to trying to make this a better game <laughs> um, is is honestly quite inspiring, really. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. But I think that speaks to the whole, like, it's good. And I keep wanting it to be good. But then I play and I have that bad game. Or then I play and it ends too quickly. Like, that's what happened in this game was... It, part of the scoring, the random scoring, is if you support a faction, you get points. And he went and got three of the same card out of a random deck. And by having three of the same card, he multiplied that by how far ahead one of the factions are. And you only played eight points. Right. So just by luck of the draw of getting those three cards, the game ended, right. like an hour and a half in. And, and that's just lame. Like even he, he won and he's like, this is lame. <laughs> <laughs> but at this point, I was done. Like, I, I had to call it a night. Uh, Tori and Kat were playing Batman Love Letter. D&D was still going. Um, Jeff had started up his 4 a.m. DCC game. That was going good. I think he had six players when I left. At this point, I went out, woke up Deanna, who was in the car, and said, look, my eyes effed up. And she saw it, and it's it was bad. It was all purple and swollen and nasty. And I was just tired. Um, so she took over at the, at the event. I went home, and I didn't make it back until I think it was 2 p.m. Hey, a lot of people uh, forget how hard it is to take care of yourself, especially when, you know, we're not we're not the teenage kids at the high, in high school nope. anymore, uh, to take care of yourself, uh, even little things like hydration uh, and making sure that when, if you're up for, if you're up for, you know, 18, 20 hours, mm -hmm. um, you need to drink a lot of water. Um, you need to stay <laughs> hydrated. And it's really easy to not because, I mean, you're staying up for 18 hours, so you're drinking a ton of yeah. coffee or things. But water is, is important. And now you were up early that day because you had yes. an interview on the radio that morning. That's correct. So, I actually did a full 24 hours, but I started my 24 hours at that interview instead of when I showed up at CG Realm. So the interview was at 8, 10 in the morning. I left CG Realm at 9 in the morning. So as far as I was concerned, I got my 24 hours in. I did extra life stuff for 24 hours. So I, I was happy with myself that way. Uh, I will admit I didn't actually play Azul till probably, I don't know, 11 or so. So I didn't do a full 24 hours at the store. But at that point, I was done. Yeah. So I got back at about 2 o'clock. Place was packed. Um, Solon Wong, local gamer who's huge into X-Wing was there and he was running his X-Wing tournament. Uh, that did fantastic for us. A uh, lot of players. They did not play with cheating. They were not interested in cheating, which I was worried that, that, like to me, I'm like, this is the one time of year you cheat. Like, come on, it's for charity. Instead, they raised entry fees, but then the store stepped up and offered some prizes. So what they were doing is between every round, they basically had a raffle for ships. So it was like, in the next, so you can have Lando's, Millennium Falcon and it's a raffle and 
you donate money and whoever gets drawn gets to keep it and then all the money went to extra life like they they raised a significant amount of money which was awesome and the guys took this game very seriously the people the uh, miniature gamers tend to take their game seriously. Uh, so Solon had his X-Wing going. Artemis had shown up. So I talked about this, how there was a guy from Kitchener who has set up a local Artemis club. This was only their second ever meeting. Uh, they had Artemis set up actually in the sandwich shop side of the of the building. Uh, it seemed to be going really well. When I showed up, there was a 12-year-old captain um, currently leading them right uh-huh. into a minefield because he was scared of all the enemies. Eh, looked like they were having fun. I thought it was amusing because Sean happened to be on the chat at the time and was trying to give them pointers. So I was sitting there telling the captain what Sean was saying. He wasn't really listening, but I was trying to give him the, a few tips. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so now... There was... Uh, yeah. Uh, you had... Uh, what else do you have? You had uh, Magic Booster being played. Yeah. Uh, magic Booster so Draft. So there was a Magic Booster Draft. Jeremy was really excited about this. I guess he... Um, is that's his favorite way to play. So Jeremy actually played in this tournament. They had some kind of magic booster draft. Um, there was a Pokemon tournament. I forgot about that. That happened overnight. So there was, a, I think it started at midnight or 1 a.m. There was a Pokemon tournament. And one of the good stories that came out of it after the fact was this, they allowed cheating. And most card gamers don't do the cheating thing, right? And it was some kind of, they were going to win a, win a booster or something like that. Um, but there's a local player who I guess, like no one can beat. Like this guy's the the Pokemon player, and someone got it in their head they had to beat this guy and cheated so many times they ran out of money and then debited $19 to finally cheat enough to beat the number one guy in the city and then immediately went on Facebook and took a, like a selfie with the guy and was like, I beat whoever. I, I don't know the names, <laughs> but I thought that was pretty good. Nice. So uh, there was a booster draft, booster, booster draft. There was lots of open gaming going on. There were people playing everywhere at this point. I'm kind of delirious. I did get some sleep, but not enough. I saw Dinosaur Island being played. Uh, a group of two guys who knew Jeff came in, bid on our silent auction on a couple things and played Small World. Um, uh, there was a group looking for something to play. I taught them junk art. I didn't play. I just taught them how to play. It was good. Uh, I personally didn't get any games in on Sunday. Uh, the silent auction was closing at four o'clock. I was busy promoting that. Um, was trying to sell off the rest of the baked goods. I was chatting with people, doing giveaways, basically did actually giveaways. I, I had mentioned we did those all night. So basically we tried to time it every hour. We gave something away. We had all, we have all kinds of promos, just stuff I've collected over the years from various tabletop days. That's a big one, actually. The the Will Wheaton tabletop days always give us give the game stores a ton of promos. We had a bunch of promos from Big J, uh, Geektropolis Cafe. We had some stuff we donated. We had some games. There was all kinds of stuff we had to give away. So about every hour, we just randomly picked someone in the store. We had a couple different ways to do that and gave them some gave them for some swag for showing up and playing with us. Um, it, it went good. Uh, the D&D group was gone when I got back at 2. D noted they, they lasted till probably about noon. Uh, the silent action ended at 4. That went really well. Um, some items had tons of bids. I think we only had two items with none. I am glad we used that format. I think it was well worth doing. Um, and then we started packing up. X-Wing ended, and we started gathering our stuff up. So now, with the event over, what was the sort of final total? <laughs> Uh, at this point, we think it's final. So this is the moment I know everyone's uh, bothered to listen this long to find out. So s- the Windsor Gaming Resource Extra Life event this year, hosted at CG Realm, raised $7,001 this year. That that blows away any one-year total we've ever had. So we mentioned at the top of the show, Sean mentioned that over six, over five years, sorry, over five years, this is our sixth year, over five years, we raised $14,000. We did half that in one event. Like that's half the amount that took it took us five years to get the fourteen thousand. We did seven thousand in one weekend, which is amazing. Seven thousand and one. Um, huge thanks to everyone who was involved. Like that that's a staggering total. I I'm, I'm amazed. My goal on the extra life page was three thousand. I was kind of hoping we'd hit six, maybe just maybe because that would hit us to twenty thousand total. The fact we beat that by another thousand blows me away now that was our five that was our final that was the the total that's gone into extra life but it doesn't have to be the end donations can still keep coming in till new year's even uh 
Kids don't stop getting sick, even if the event is over. So, if you would like to support them, you can stop by WindsorExtraLife.com and hit the donate button uh, until the end of the year. And then uh, we'll take a break and uh, we'll come back again next year and we'll see if we can do something even bigger. No, I agree. Yeah, we are still looking for your support. Uh, even more so, get ready for me to be talking about this next year. We're hoping to be bigger than ever. Um, Deanna and I don't actually have any charity experience. We're just winging this, right? Jeremy, on the hand, who owns CG Realm, has more charity experience. And he is convinced we're making 10000 next year. And he has all kinds of plans. So I'm hoping that works out. I, I'm hoping that it does turn out that well. Um, he's done a couple um, charity events for the Kidney Foundation and another one where they've raised more than this in one day. And he thinks he's got some ways to get money out of people's pockets. Um, plus getting more corporate donations, things like that. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, plus, I got to admit, I'm kind of looking forward to someone else taking on more of the <laughs> organization and controlling it because, man, I was beat. I'm still beat. I'm still kind of tired from it. And then just jumping back to the eye for a minute, I did mention it. So I went to the doctor two days later. Monday, I just slept till like 3 p.m. Yeah, I took a day off, basically. Um, Tuesday, my Monday, my eye was feeling better. It wasn't all purple anymore, but it still kind of hurt. So Tuesday, I went to the eye doctors. It ends up I had removed a one-centimeter patch of my epithelial layer of my eye. As far as the doctor can tell, my eye dried out or something. It stuck to the lens and or my lid, and when the lid opened, it tore away like a like – a, not deep, but like postage stamp size, like one centimeter by one centimeter section. Now it looks fine. So I went there. They gave me these. It's basically Vaseline mixed with antibiotics, really gross crap. I have to put in my eye um, every day. And he wanted to see me every morning at 8 a.m. before his shift started so he could see how I was doing because he was that concerned that there'd be a problem. I went back this morning. Things look good enough. He doesn't want to see me again until Friday. Keep putting goop in my eye. So I don't know. I don't know what it did. I don't, I, I swear it was the tim hortons donut stuff like was glue i don't know <laughs> or it was completely not has anything to do with it i don't know but it's healing it's looking good it seems to be going well so terrible timing that's all i can say on that one either way hydrate don't tear your eyes apart hydrate yes hydrate. blink remember that you said you <laughs> were you staring intently at the games you were playing i'm like i don't know maybe Quite possibly fun. Those little, those little tiny meeple on uh, on the zombies. The, the uh, zombie epic uh, mini. <laughs> it was just before I started tiny epic zombies is when it started bugging me. So I don't know. Well, this was a great talk and a long one. But if you'd like to read more on this topic, <laughs> there may be a blog on the tabletopbellhop.com where you can see uh, this and and some other information on uh, the extra life experience. Yeah, one of these days I'll remember to update that when we don't do uh, – it's not a follow-up to a blog post. But yeah, as normal, like this was a special episode, but normally we are here to answer your gaming questions, not our own gaming questions. And normally I'm not doing events every weekend, so I have time to actually answer people's questions. So please send us your questions. Uh, you can do that on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. As a special bonus to our Patreon patrons, we will answer your questions questions you do get bumped to the top now speaking of our patreon a shout out and a thank you to our backers their support helps make this show possible uh misdirected mark these guys should be back from metatopia now and you can again start watching them live on tuesdays at 8 45 eastern right here on twitch brian kurtz thanks duran barnett thank you joe swick it is appreciated and I'd like to welcome our latest patron, Steve D. Thank you for showing your support. Uh, uh, he's probably, yeah, and he's still in the chat room. There we go. I'm sure he's lurking. <laughs> he, he tends to put it on and do other stuff when yep. listen in. It is appreciated. Thanks, Steve. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end. It should have been over a while ago, but we've been chatting in the break room, it feels like. Uh, we're going to have to lock the front doors and kick everyone out, though. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you dig the content we're providing and like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. 
Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around for a short while in our penthouse suite for an Off the Books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.